I didn't even care to see what helpline it was. I just found the number and kept on dialing, kept on calling them. But they were not picking up, so I went back to read what was written in the description. It said it was Monday to Saturday, and I remember it was Sunday, 9 p.m. ish. So I was like, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? Can I not be suicidal on a Sunday? And I didn't know about this before. I thought all the helplines are 24 7. Hi, my name is Sachin, and today I'll be presenting to you our work from Kai 2021. Or can I not be suicidal on a Sunday? Understanding technology mediated pathways to mental health support. For context, I'll begin with a brief overview of our work from Kai 2020. In this work, we interviewed helpline volunteers, Indian mental health helpline volunteers, to better understand how they use their lived experiences and leverage their cultural backgrounds and their local context to better serve the diverse needs of callers. We found that callers form really, really deep and therapeutic bonds with volunteers to the point where callers even do update calls with volunteers to let them know when they're feeling better. However, there's a common understanding in India, as shown in our introduction, that helplines just don't work. To better understand how helplines don't work and who they don't work for, this work we asked the question, how does the design of the Indian mental health helpline system interact with societal factors to marginalize callers' individual identity-based needs? In this work, we leverage the pathway to care model to better understand how helplines play into participants' broader engagements with care. We also leverage SEND's delineation of institutional justice and justice as experienced to envision what a more just helpline might look like. In SEND's view, lived experience should be used to evaluate whether justice is done and not solely be based on abstract laws or institutions. Finally, we leverage a design justice framework to better understand how technical factors interact with structural factors to marginalize people's individual identity-based needs. To do so, we did interviews with 18 different participants that we characterize as helpline stakeholders, which included both people who called helplines and people who consciously decided not to call out of a belief that helplines don't work. Moving on to the first part of our findings, we found that helplines were a place for people to go in crisis, particularly given a lack of support in everyday life, as the quote from Mitali shows. Participants often found helplines via friends or via Google, including recommendations after they searched uh, like a means of suicide. Trust was really important, and many intentionally searched for helplines and used helplines that they felt looked trustworthy, such as those that explicitly said that they were queer affirmative. However, as the quote from Juhi shows, people didn't really know what to expect before calling and were concerned about active non-consensual rescue in which the helplines would call people in theory without the consent of the caller. However, from our past work, we know that Indian helplines don't call anyone without the consent of the caller. This wasn't communicated to callers. Moving on to the second section of our findings, when after people actually called the number, we found that the number recommended by Google, as well as the numbers that they would find online, often did not work. People would engage in a trial and error process, sometimes leveraging multiple phones, trying as many numbers as possible until one of them actually worked. Participants who had poor experiences had little ability because of this to leave any kind of feedback and were concerned about their confidentiality being violated if they gave bad feedbacks. There were different ideas of what a successful interaction could look like, but one participant summed it up the best when they said that a great interaction was when they felt safe. Identity was also very important with regards to how people use the helpline. As the quotes from Juhi and Donna show, class and caste both had an influence on pe how people understood and used or explicitly decided not to use the helplines. Participants related helplines as another form of mental health care that didn't work with them and drew parallels between their experiences in therapy and their experiences with like helpline volunteers and what they expected out of helpline volunteers. I'll move on to our recommendations. So we make several different recommendations in our paper. Some important ones are signaling the wait time that corresponds to being actually connected, call routing that routes callers to whichever helpline is most free, enabling volunteers to connect callers to different and diverse sources of care, and having mechanisms for feedback. Other structural recommendations include more information about the calling experience, including what happens afterwards, and boundaries, such as making sure that callers know that the police won't be called and external parties will not be called without their consent. Additionally, we recommend that helpline administrators integrate the volunteer backgrounds and their diversity into how helplines are administered, especially those who come from underserved and underrepresented backgrounds. Thank you so much for watching this presentation, and I look forward to your questions.